This evening we're continuing our overview of the Old Testament book titled 1 Kings. As you open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 6, I want to take a moment to put our text back into its context. And it'll first help you to remember that the Lord not only called David's son Solomon to serve him as the king of Israel, but he also instructed Solomon to accomplish the desires of David and to do this by building a temple which would become the house of the Lord. And it's here in our text tonight where we find Solomon. He's doing just that. He's constructing the house of the Lord. Now, as we make our way through this incredible chapter, we're going to spend some time considering the floor plan of the temple and the, the different design elements. But before we do all of that, it, it's important for me to remind you that the temple that Solomon built uh, was actually a symbol. It was a shadow, which uh, was, it was a shadow that was being cast by the substance of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in light of this truth, we're going to consider the way in which the construction of Solomon's temple actually points us back to our Savior, Jesus. And not only that, but it points us to the true sanctuary of the Christian church. And with this as our focus, if you would, let's turn our attention to the events that unfold here in 1 Kings chapter 6. If you would look with me there, we'll begin at verse 1, where we learn that it came to pass in the 418th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. Now here in the opening verse of this chapter, we learn that the children of Israel, they had been there in the land of promise for more than 400 years and in that period of time, you know, the, the, they had been engaging in the sacrificial system uh, there at the tabernacle of Moses. And so it was 400 years, a little bit more than that, after entering into the land of promise when Solomon finally began to build the temple there on Mount Moriah. Until that day, like I said, the sacrificial system, it took place at the tabernacle that Moses created. And that, that tabernacle had been stationed in the city of Shiloh. Uh, we should also notice there at the end of verse 1 where the author of this account referred to the temple as Beth Yehovah, which is translated the house of the Lord. Now this is not to suggest that the Lord of heaven and earth was literally dwelling in a man-made temple. It's like, you know, God was looking for some good real estate and he's just wondering where he can find a nice house. And no, it wasn't like that. The, the Lord of heaven and earth doesn't dwell in, in temples made by men. That's not what, uh, what we're learning here. No, it's at the house of the Lord. This was the place where God was simply choosing to make his glory known here on the earth. And while it's true that the manifestation of God's glory was found in the tabernacle of Moses, just above the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, it's also true that the glory of God would be manifest in the temple of Solomon, just as it had been in the tabernacle. And we're going to learn more about that when we get to 1 Kings chapter 8. For now, I just want to continue to consider the floor plan of Solomon's temple. And if you would look with me, beginning at verse 2, here we learn that the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, its length was 60 cubits, its width 20, and its height 30 cubits. The vestibule in front of the sanctuary of the house was 20 cubits long across the width of the house, and the width of the vestibule extended 10 cubits from the front of the house. Now, here in these verses, we find the basic measurements of the temple, and, and you know, they might as well just be using the metric system here, because I don't know what they're saying. I remember as a kid when they tried to can, you know, transition us from, you know, the, the system that you, we use to the, to the European metric system. And, and within a year, the entire, you know, government gave up on Americans ever learning the metric system. And so here we are back to inches and yards and whatnot. But uh, here we find a whole nother measurement system called cubits. And, and you know, it, that might seem, seem easy to say, well, what, what's a cubit? And, and uh, it's not that easy. Measurements that, that are called cubits, the, the ancient cubit, it actually varied from culture to culture. As a matter of fact, the, the, the cubit could be as small as 17 and a half inches and it could be as large as 21 inches long, just depending on where you were. Most biblical scholars believe that the cubit used by those in the Middle East, in, including the Israelites, it was a cubit that measured 18 inches. And if that's the case, then the temple proper was approximately 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. 
Now, as we consider these measurements, it's easy to see that the, the temple wasn't a massive structure. It wasn't some ginormous building. It was actually kind of small. And in order to understand the small size of the sanctuary, I should remind you that the house of the Lord, it wasn't an auditorium where the entire nation of Israel would congregate together. And, and, and you know, it, it wasn't you know, supposed to fit everyone in the nation into a single building. No, instead, the temple proper was a sanctuary which was used to house the, the, the temple furniture, which included the altar of incense, the, the table for the showbread, and the golden lampstand. And, and then within the Holy of Holies, there was found the golden ark of the covenant. So it didn't need to be a, a huge space. And it's also interesting to note that the, the only people who were actually allowed to enter into the sanctuary of the temple... Well, they were the ordained priests who were charged to enter in at specific times in order to accomplish specific tasks. Meanwhile, the congregation of Israel, they would gather together outside in their respective courts. There was the court uh, of Israel where the men would gather, and then there was the court of the women where the, where the women would gather. And, and there they would lift up their prayers and praises to the Lord as the sacrifices were being offered. I realize, you know, as we consider the, the concept of the sanctuary and it being a small building, which you know, only a few people were allowed to go into, I, I, I realize that it's not uncommon for Christians to call the auditorium of the church the sanctuary. You know, are we going into the sanctuary? And the, you know, the auditorium is the sanctuary, and it's just kind of wrong. And I don't mean to refer, you know, to suggest that you know you're, you're sinning if you call this auditorium the sanctuary, uh, but it's just not exactly correct. The church building is not the sanctuary, and the reason why I say that is because the church building is not the house of the Lord. You know, you know this, this is you know a nice space for us to meet in, and I praise God that He's provided it to us. But I just want you to to understand that you know we we don't make a complete uh, you know. Uh, comparison between the temple, which was the house of the Lord, and the church with the sanctuary being the auditorium. That's not uh, an apples to apples comparison. In order to further explain my point, let's continue to consider the, the floor plan for the sanctuary that Solomon was building. If you would look with me there beginning at verse 4, because here we learn that he made for the house windows with beveled frames. Against the wall of the temple he built chambers all around. Against the walls of the temple all around the sanctuary and the inner sanctuary. Thus he made side chambers all around it. The lowest chamber was five cubits wide. The middle was six cubits wide. And the third was seven cubits wide. For he made narrow ledges around the outside of the temple so that the support beams would not be fastened into the walls of the temple. Now, here in these verses, we learn that there were these side chambers where the priests would live while they were serving at the temple. And there in verse 5, we learn that this, this three-story apartment complex, it went all the way around the sanctuary as well as around the inner sanctuary, which is simply to say that the priestly quarters surrounded three sides of the sanctuary, which uh, is more commonly referred to as the holy place and the holy of holies. At the same time, though, we should also notice that there was some level of separation between the chambers and the sanctuary. And if you would notice it with me again there in verse 6, where we learn that Solomon made narrow ledges around the outside of the temple so that the support beams would not be fastened into the walls of the temple. And so there's some level of separation in the architecture here between those apartment complexes and, or, or, or those living or dwelling places, those chambers, and, and the 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 sanctuary in which was the holy place and the holy of holies. In light of this, we can see then that the, the sanctuary itself, it was separate, it was set apart from those common use rooms where the priests were living. Not only that, but Solomon also made sure that the sanctuary was free from the sound pollution of construction tools. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me there at verse seven, where we, uh, we read here that the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone finished at the quarry so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. Based on this, we can see that the sanctuary stones, they, they were quarried and cut to size at some distance from Temple Mount. And not, not only were those sanctuary stones cut you know, off site, but, but all the rest of the structure, all the stones necessary for, for the entire structure there on Temple Mount, all of those stones were cut at a distance away from the, the sanctuary so that the, the sound of construction couldn't be heard inside 
the sanctuary after it had been completed. And, and, and as we consider, you know, how, uh, you know, these stones were being quarried and, and cut to size, you know, at a distance away from uh, Temple Mount, uh, imagine if you would the frustration that you would feel if you were the mason who, who, who received a stone that had just come back after being carried up to Temple Mount and then brought back and it wasn't right. And, and this would be a huge endeavor just to get the stones up there was, was a massive project. And then to imagine that it was cut wrong and you got to do it all over again. Oh, that would be so frustrating. I'm going to guess that the, the saying that goes like this, measure twice and cut once, I'm guessing it was made up by a Jew uh, right there in Israel during this day and age. The first stone that came back is just, okay, we're measuring everything twice so that we can just cut it once and be done with it. Well, regardless of how many times a stone was sent back, what we do know is that the noise pollution of construction tools, it couldn't be heard there on Temple Mount. One reason why is due to the fact that Temple Mount, well, it had been sanctified and set apart for the service of the Lord. And not only that, but the outer courts there on Temple Mount, they were, they were to be a place of prayer and praise. And so imagine if you would, you know, going up to the Temple Mount to, to pray and, and, and praise the Lord, and, but all you can hear is the work of masons cutting stone. Well, all, all of that work was being done at a distance so that the noise couldn't be heard there on Temple Mount. And in light of this, I can't help but to consider something that Jesus said on the day of his triumphal entry. If you would, hold your place here in the book of 1 Kings, and if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 19. You see, it's in the, in the 19th chapter of Luke where we find the Lord Jesus. He's preparing to enter the city of Jerusalem where he would once again cleanse the outer court of the temple he did this at the beginning of his earthly ministry, and then he did it again at the end of his earthly ministry. And as he made his way down the Mount of Olives and towards Temple Mount, uh, the disciples of Jesus, they began to sing his praises because they, they recognized that this was the time of his triumphal entry, though they didn't fully understand what that meant. But they began to sing his praises, and, and then the, the religious leaders rebuked Jesus for their songs of praise. As a matter of fact, look with me there at Luke 19, beginning at verse 37. Here Luke writes, Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. He's not talking about the rolling stones. He's talking about the stones who were there in Israel. And, and listen, it's possible, just possible, that the Lord was referring to the small stones which were there on the ground. It, it may even be that he was talking about stones which, which may have made up the, the path there down the Mount of Olives. And yet I would point out that the Greek word which is translated stones here, it's, it's also used of the stones which were used in construction. Therefore, Jesus, I believe that he's probably talking about the stones that made up Temple Mount. I'll remind you, this event is taking place right under the shadow of Temple Mount. As he's making his way down the Mount of Olives, he can look straight across and see there's Temple Mount. And it seems to me here that the Lord Jesus is referring to the stones of the temple when he says, hey, if my disciples don't sing my praises, the stones of the temple will. I believe that Jesus wasn't suggesting that the stones would literally start singing and yet it does seem to me that the temple stones, they were actually designed to reveal the glory of God's promised Messiah. Remember, the temple is the place where the glory of God was manifest above the mercy seat of the ark. The very stones of the temple, which were cut off site and at a distance where you couldn't hear the construction happening, those stones were designed to direct the attention of Israel to the promised Messiah who truly reveals the glory of God. And while it's true that the sound of those stones being chiseled was never heard on Temple Mount, 
The stones still sang the praises of the promised Messiah from the very day that they were set in place until that day when our Savior's triumphal entry occurred as he made his way up. We have to understand that this was this transitional time from the old covenant to the new covenant. This was that transitional time when the Lord Jesus was coming to write the new covenant with his blood. And with this as our focus, if you would, let's make our way back to 1 Kings chapter 6 where we find the Lord here recounting the rules and regulations of the old covenant. If you would look with me, we'll begin reading at verse 8 where we learn that the doorway for the middle story was on the right side of the temple. They went up by stairs to the middle story and from the middle to the third. So he built the temple and finished it and he paneled the temple with beams and boards of cedar and he built side chambers against the entire temple, each five cubits high. They were attached to the temple with cedar beams. Then the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying, concerning this temple which you are building, if you walk in my statutes execute my judgments, keep all my commandments, and walk in them. Then I will perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father David, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Here in these verses we find the Lord, he's reminding Solomon about the covenant that he made with the children of Israel. And as we consider this reminder, it seems to me here that the Lord, he wanted Solomon to understand that this upgrade from the old tabernacle of Moses to the the new temple that he was building, this, this upgrade, it wasn't a basis for changing the covenant that the Lord previously made with Moses. The Lord didn't want Solomon thinking that, well, now that we've got you a nicer house and a better place to live, you know, let's, let's maybe, you know, ease up on some of these commandments. How about that? No, not at all. The covenant which was previously made with Israel through Moses, it was based on the reciprocating relationship as defined by the law of God. And with this in mind, if you would notice with me again there in verse 12, because there again the Lord sums it all up by declaring, if you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, and keep all of my commandments and walk in them, here's the if. If you do these things, then I will perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father David. That's the old covenant. Here's the law, here's the rules, here's the rituals. Do all of these things, and if you do, then I will dwell among you. We see that there in verse 13, I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. In other words, the Lord is letting them know that he would continue to manifest his glory there at the temple. He would continue to provide them with the temporary atonement of the sacrificial system so long as they were faithfully following the rules and the rituals as designed by the Mosaic law. Conversely, the Lord was also assuring Solomon that his glory would certainly depart from the sanctuary if they failed to walk according to his statutes and his judgments and all of his commandments. This is the old covenant. You do this, and I'll bless you in this way. Well, it's true that the Lord was expecting his people to live according to the rules of the old covenant. It's, it's also true that the temple was actually designed to point to a new covenant, which is based on much better promises. And in order to prove my point, let's continue to consider the design elements of the temple here. If you would look with me, we'll pick up at verse 14. Here we learn that Solomon built the temple and finished it. And he built the inside walls of the temple with cedar boards. From the floor of the temple to the ceiling, he paneled the inside with wood. And he covered the floor of the temple with planks of cypress. Then he built the 20-cubit room at the rear of the temple from floor to ceiling with cedar boards. He built it inside as the inner sanctuary as the most holy place. And in front of it, the temple sanctuary was 40 cubits long. The inside of the temple was cedar, carved with ornamental buds and open flowers, all with cedar. There was no stone to be seen. Now here in these verses, we learn about the way in which Solomon decorated the interior of the temple's sanctuary. He used all kinds of different kinds of woods, and and this included cedar and cypress. and, And this, of course, reminds us of the way in which our promised Messiah was sent to fulfill the law on our behalf on that tragic day when he was crucified on a wooden cross. 
The wood there in the temple reminds us of the wooden cross that the Lord Jesus hung upon in our place. And so we see that the temple, it not only pointed to the righteous requirements of the law, which were written in stone, but the stone was covered with wood. And because of the wood, you couldn't even see the stone. And that's how it is in Christ. Christ. When you come to the, to the wooden cross, it covers the, the stone which the Ten Commandments was written upon. The Lord Jesus died on a cross made of wood to free us from the righteous requirements of the law which was written on stone. This points us to the new covenant which was written in the blood of our Savior Jesus. And not only that, but the temple is also designed to remind the Israelites about the beauty of holiness which is found there in the heavenlies. And with this in mind, look with me there beginning at verse 19. Here we learn that Solomon prepared the inner sanctuary inside the temple to set the ark of the covenant of the Lord there. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. He overlaid it with pure gold and overlaid the altar of cedar. So Solomon overlaid the inside of the temple with pure gold. He stretched gold chain across the front of the inner sanctuary and overlaid it with gold. The whole temple he overlaid with gold until he had finished all the temple. Also he overlaid with gold the entire altar that was by the inner sanctuary. And here in these verses we learn that Solomon covered the inner sanctuary with pure gold. And so imagine for a moment you're standing there in the court of the Israelites and you're watching the priests, you know, preparing the sacrifices. And, and then when it's time to take the blood of the sacrifice into uh, the, the, the sanctuary, the priest then opens the huge doors of the sanctuary. And as he enters in with the blood of the sacrifice, there's just this brief moment when you catch a glimpse of the light that's emanating from that golden lampstand that's just, you know, sitting right there inside. And, and the, the light from that golden lampstand is being, you know, illuminated. It's, it's, it's reflecting off of all the gold in the room, and, and you just see this golden glow coming out of this beautiful temple. It must have been incredible to be standing there and to see the, the beauty of holiness emanating forth from the sanctuary of God. There's no doubt in my mind that you would be brought to a point of praise as you're standing there on Temple Mount just seeing the glory of God manifest from the sanctuary. I like the way the psalmist described this very moment in the 96th Psalm. It's there where he declares, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory. Do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The beauty of holiness. You know, the, the culture here in America is very confused about what true beauty is. True beauty is holiness. And while the beauty of holiness can be a very abstract concept, which which is difficult for us to grasp, especially being raised in this American culture, the Lord gave his people a, a glimpse into the beauty of holiness by directing Solomon to fill the sanctuary with golden light. The light emanating from the the. The lampstand there, you know, just reflecting and refracting off all the gold that's in there and, and, and the glory of God manifesting in there and, and just catching a little glimpse of that as the doors were opened. The people got a little taste of the true beauty of holiness. And while the holy place there in the sanctuary was, was certainly beautiful, the holy of holies was even more so. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me here, beginning at verse 23, here we read, inside the inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood, each 10 cubits high. One wing of the cherub was five cubits, and the other wing of the cherub, five cubits, 10 cubits from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. And the other cherub was 10 cubits. Both cherubim were of the same size and shape. The height of one cherub was 10 cubits, and so was the other cherub. 
Then he set the cherubim inside the inner room, and they stretched out the wings of the cherubim so that the wing of one touched one wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall. And their wings touched each other in the middle of the room. Also, he overlaid the cherubim with gold. Then he carved all the walls of the temple all around, both the inner and outer sanctuaries, with carved figures of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. And the flower of the temple he overlaid with gold, both the inner and outer sanctuaries. For the entrance of the inner sanctuary, he made doors of olive wood. The lintel and doorposts were one-fifth of the wall. The two doors were of olive wood, and he carved them uh, on them figures of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, and overlaid them with gold. And he spread gold on the cherubim on, and on the palm trees. So for the door of the sanctuary, he also made doorposts of olive wood, one-fourth of the wall. And the two doors were of cypress wood, two panels comprised one folding door, and two panels comprised the other folding door. Then he carved cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers on them, and overlaid them with gold applied evenly on the carved work. And he built the inner court with three rows of hewn stone and a row of cedar beams. I hear in these verses we find Solomon, he's continuing to adorn the temple with all of this beautiful artwork, which was overlaid with even more gold. And as we consider the way in which he, he created gold-covered cherubim there in the sanctuary of God, it's important to understand that, that we're not talking about little chubby babies with wings. You know, that's, that's one thing that, that we kind of have been taught to believe is that these cherubs, they're like little babies with wings, you know, and that's just not the case at all. These were big burly angels that, that stretched from, from wall to wall there in the sanctuary of God. There in the Holy of Holies, there was these massive angels standing guard over the ark. As we consider this artwork, as we consider the way that, that Solomon created these artistic depictions of angels there in the sanctuary of God. I can't help but to remember the vision that John had of the throne room, which is there in heaven. And according to John, there's this sea of glass before the throne of God, which uh, was symbolized by the golden floor, which is found there in the sanctuary. He overlays the wood on the floor with gold. And so there's this sea of glass, a, a sea of gold, if you will, before the ark of God. And not only that, but the throne of God there in heaven is surrounded by cherubim and seraphim, and they're all worshiping God. And, and all of this is depicted by the artists who helped Solomon build the temple. And so it was kind of a little picture of what's happening there in the throne room of heaven. Now, as we consider the way in which Solomon commissioned those artists to, to create those angelic images, uh, you know, the, the student of the Bible might be quick to ask, well, well, hold on a second, you know, isn't this breaking the first commandment? With this question in mind, I'll remind you that the first commandment, which is found in Exodus chapter 20, this is where the Lord declares, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image any of any likeness of anything that is on heaven or is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the, uh, under, under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Now, as we consider this commandment, there are some who take this to mean that it's a sin to have an image of anything. That, that to own a statue of, of, of anything would be a sin, but I don't believe that's the case at all. You see, I don't believe the Lord was placing a prohibition on the creation of carved images. No, instead he's placing a restriction upon any carved image which is designed to be used for the purpose of worshiping a false idol. That's not what Solomon was doing here. He wasn't creating cherubim there in the, the, the sanctuary to be worshipped. No, they, they were just carved images for the purpose of, of, of art, for the, for the purpose of beauty. Solomon wasn't creating idols which were to be worshipped, and so we can rest assured in knowing that there was nothing sinful going on here, and, and, and there was nothing wrong with those artists creating those depictions of heavenly cherubim. Finally, we should also consider the time frame in which this work was completed. And with this is our focus. If you would look with me there beginning at verse 37, because here we read, in the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Ziv, and in the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished in all its details and according to all its plans. So he was seven years in building it. It took seven years 
for him to build the entire structure there on Temple Mount. And as we consider the intricacy and the beauty and all the artistic work and all of this, it just blows my mind that this government was able to get a building project done in seven years. <laughs> Truly amazing. Miraculous, I would even say. Now, I don't put a whole great deal of stock in biblical numerology, but I do think it's interesting that it was finished or completed in seven years. One reason why is because some biblical scholars believe that the, the number seven in the Bible represents completion. For example, our, our, our week is a seven-day week. We have seven days to complete the week. We also find the Lord Jesus making seven I am statements in the Gospels, each of which are designed to reveal that he is God incarnate. When we look at the book of Revelation alone, I mean, there's just you know, a, a myriad of sevens used there. That we find seven letters to seven churches in Asia. There's seven spirits before uh, the throne of God, which reveal the seven ministries of Christ Jesus, the, the seven golden lampstands, which are there, the seven stars in Christ's right hand, the seven seals of God's judgment, and, and the seven angels with the seven trumpets. Like I said, I don't put a whole lot of stock in, in biblical numerology, but there seems to be some significance to the number seven. And it's for this reason that some scholars, as they look at all the different uses of the number seven throughout the Bible, they, uh, there are those who believe that the number seven is the number of completion. And so it only makes sense that the temple would have been completed in seven years, and it was. Speaking of seven and the, and, and the concept of completion, I'll also remind you the time of tribulation is also going to last for seven years. It begins with the rise of the Antichrist, which occurs after the rapture of the church, and, and then the seven-year tribulation is completed at the time of Christ's second coming. It's at that point in time when God incarnate will truly dwell with men, not because of the old covenant, but because of the new covenant. In the old covenant, God said, hey, you do these things, I'll dwell with you. That's the old covenant. But under the new covenant, the Lord Jesus comes and he signs this new contract in his blood and says, I'm coming to dwell with you. The question is, do you want to dwell with me? And by faith, we enter into that agreement. For now, though, the Lord Jesus is calling his church to continue building the spiritual house of the Lord. There's no doubt that God incarnate is coming to dwell here on this planet. He's going to rule and reign over this planet for a thousand years. He is coming to dwell with us based on his new covenant. And he's giving us the opportunity right now to be a part of that, to be a part of his kingdom. And with this in mind, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, because it's in 1 Peter chapter 2 where we find the apostle Peter, he's helping his audience to understand that those who trust in the Lord Jesus, we now have become the living stones of the Lord's temple. And in order to understand what this actually means, practically speaking, I want to consider how Peter uh, reveals this here in his first epistle. If you would look with me there at 1 Peter chapter 2, we'll begin reading at verse 1. Here Peter encourages every Christian to lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, notice, as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Christian, listen, as we consider what Peter is saying here, it's important to understand that this auditorium is not the sanctuary of God. 
This auditorium is a wonderful place for us to meet and worship, and I, and I, and I love that the Lord has provided this for us, but this auditorium, it's just that. It's an auditorium. This is not the sanctuary of God. No one said, those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have come to the cross of Christ and entered into the new covenant by faith in his finished work, we've become his sanctuary. We've become the living stones of the Lord's sanctuary. And what this means then is that we are the stones who ought to be crying out as we offer the Lord the sacrifice of praise. Oh, I get it. Showing up to church and singing the praises of God, it, it can be a sacrifice, especially when there's so many other things on the list to do. And that's why Paul calls it the sacrifice of praise, which he calls the fruit of our lips. It's the giving of thanks to the name of God. And yet we should remember that we are those living stones that ought to be crying out and singing the praises of our Savior. And not only have we been called to gather together so that we can sing the praises of our king, but we've also been called to become those living stones who are covered with the golden glory of God's holiness. Much like those temple stones, which were first covered with, with wood and then with gold, we too have become living stones, which when we are covered with the wood of the cross, we can then be covered with the gold of God's holiness. And with that being the case, Christian, I encourage you, let's follow the instructions that Peter gave us there in verse one by laying aside all malice. Let us set aside all deceit and, and any hypocrisy or envy or evil speaking. Let's lay all of that aside. And instead, let's look to the pure milk of God's word, which helps us to grow and be sanctified into the believers that the Lord would have us to become. Let's seek the sanctifying power of our Savior because he alone is able to chisel away the corruption of our carnal flesh. One of the best ways for this to happen is by us as living stones joining together in true Christian fellowship, encouraging one another with the word of God, seeking him together as the sanctuary of God. We should spend time together worshiping the King of Kings. And as we do, I believe the Lord will bless his church. And he will cover us with the glorious beauty of his holiness.